5 News special presentation, the Vermont Congressional Debate, live from South Burlington. Thanks for joining us this evening for NBC 5's third debate ahead of the general election. I'm Brian Collar and joined by Alice Kang and Stuart Ledbetter. Thanks, Brian. Tonight, uh, we're coming to you live from the Library Auditorium uh, here in South Burlington. With us, we have the two candidates vying to be uh, Vermont's next member uh, in Congress, the lone seat in the House of Representatives. Democrat Becca Ballant of Brattleboro is with us. She is the state Senate president. And uh, we're joined by Republican nominee Liam Madden of Bellows Falls. He's a Marine Corps veteran and renewable energy professional. Welcome to you both. Thank now you. we have a few simple rules to follow tonight. Each candidate will have a minute to give opening statements followed by general questions and direct questions. Rebuttals will be allowed at our discretion. And finally, we'll have a lightning round and one minute for closing statements. So let's begin with opening statements. Mr. Madden, we'll start with you. Fellow Vermonters, my name is Liam Madden. I am a Marine Corps veteran who became the leader of the nation's largest anti-war organization of Iraq veterans, which shows that I will stand up for our ideals and values even when it is unpopular and dangerous. I am a renewable energy professional who co-won MIT Solve Award for business models that address climate change. And although I was nominated to be here by the Republican Party, I am an independent who is calling for nothing less than a renaissance to our political problem solving. Because as a father, I am deeply concerned about a future in the hands of two parties that never seem to summon the courage to stand up to the war machine or the corporate money that funds them. And they are often so sure that they're right, that they're willing to silence the truth and to believe their own lies when it helps them maintain power. Martin Luther King said, it is great disappointment only comes where there is great love and it is with great love that I am calling for a new political system that is in service to peace, prosperity and community and that is what will help us create as Vermont's representative in Congress. And Ms. Ballant. Thank you, good evening, thanks for joining tonight. I'm Becca Ballant, I am a mom, I am a former teacher and I'm also the current president of the Vermont Senate. And I got into this race for Congress because I'm deeply concerned about the democracy itself. And we see across the nation right now, election deniers on the ballot in just about every state. We see people being stripped off voting rolls, legal voters not being allowed to vote. So the democracy itself is in peril. And for me, it isn't a theoretical issue. My grandfather was killed in the Holocaust and I was taught at a really young age that democracies don't fail overnight. They fail little by little as norms are upended and rights are eroded and that we have to do everything that we can to protect democracy. That's why I got in this race. I know that we have so much work ahead of us to do for working families and we're not going to be able to do any of it if we don't have a working democracy. I hope you'll support my campaign. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, now we'll begin a round of questions for both of you, uh, starting with climate. Should the U.S. expand, uh, the federal government do all it can to expand domestic oil and gas production to get through the next year or two to bring prices down at the pump and uh, for our uh, home heating fuels, uh, even if the long-term goal must be to move to an alternative energy economy? Mr. Madden? So a little background to help catch some Vermonters up. I am a solar energy professional. I've devoted my life to healing the relationship between the earth and humanity. So with that in mind, I want people to understand that I, I consider climate change a serious risk. Uh, would I be somewhat open-minded about a very short-term expansion of other energy sources? I could be open-minded about that, but in the big picture, the issue of climate change is more of a symptom of our sustainability challenge than a root cause. And it can be divided into how do we remove carbon from our atmosphere, which is best done through the right farming practices, which can avoid higher taxes and enrich our lives, our food systems, our farmers. And the other problem is how do we transition to new energy sources um, instead of ones that are running out like fossil fuels. And I see the way to do that is to begin acknowledging that renewables cannot be the backbone of our energy future. 
And really the only proven technology that can be is a thorium life cycle nuclear energy. Although I am interested in many other innovations in research and development, but we need to be rooted in reality about what is proven to work. Thanks. Ms. Ballant. So it is not sustainable for us to continue to rely on fossil fuels. And I was uh, really frustrated, disheartened today when I saw that uh, the top five fossil fuel corporations earned over $100 billion in profits in the first quarter alone. So we have uh, in front of us a time of real hardship for Vermonters. I feel it at the pump every time I fill up my car traveling around the state. And I certainly feel it um, as I fill up my tank for the winter. And I'm so proud that Leahy um, made sure that we had extra funds in the LIHEAP uh, reserves for uh, our seniors this, this summer, excuse me, this winter to make sure that we can heat our homes. But I think as a nation, we really need to be moving off of fossil fuels, making it more possible for Vermonters to use um, alternative energy sources. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Speaking of hardship, uh, let's talk inflation. It's a global problem right now here in the U.S. It's at 8.2%. Uh, the question is, what should Congress do in the coming year to rein in the prices? Do you favor something like a windfall profits tax, or do you agree that the Fed is right to try to attack inflation by raising interest rates, even if that triggers uh, higher unemployment or a possible recession? Uh, Ms. Ballant, let's start with you. Sure. So first of all, I know the Fed is doing all that it can right now to try to uh, put some brakes on, on the economy. Unfortunately, that has uh, quite a long tail. It's going to be a while before we see those effects. So in the short term, we really need to attack inflation with several different tools, one being the windfall profits tax on fossil fuels. Absolutely. We also have to look at the price gouging that's going on right now. And there are several uh, House members and senators that have bills uh, in, in the works right now concerning price gouging. I also think we need to be investing more, and we see this in the Inflation Reduction Act passed by the Biden administration. Administration. We need to be investing more in creating more of our products here at home so we're not so caught uh, in these terrible situations with the um, supply chain. I hear this from companies, small businesses around Vermont. They're really hurting in their own prices because they can't source the materials closer to home. So I really think this can be a, uh, a time for us to get really serious about building more things back here in the United States. Mr. Madden, what should Congress do? Well, inflation is a complex issue. There are some simple things we can do. Uh, right off the bat, say windfall profit tax uh, makes sense to me. In terms of using the Fed and the leverage point of, of interest rates, uh, yeah, that would take a long time. And I think that would hurt, hurt, harm workers the most. If you look at the work of Oxford economics professor Richard Warner, he says that interest rates actually don't affect or slow down the economy the way um, that economic orthodoxy would predict. The economic situation where people who are lower and middle income are hurting for money is um, not something that began in the last year. This is something with a decades old priority in our economy for war spending and concentrating wealth the, to up 1%. So if we want to begin to reverse that priority and actually make resources available for working people, things like affordable housing and, oh, stop, sorry, cheers. <laughs> All right, switching gears now, let's talk about the Speaker of the House. The choice may come down to Kevin McCarthy or Nancy Pelosi. In which case, who will you vote for or is there someone else? Mr. Madden, we'll start with you. I would probably abstain from those two choices. As an independent, I feel like I would have uh, some leverage to be a trusted voice, to be an emissary between the parties. And uh, unless I was, ex it was an extremely close house and I could leverage that power for Vermonters, in order to maintain that independence, I would probably abstain from that choice. Is there someone else that comes to mind? In the house? No one's coming to mind right now. All right, Ms. Ballin? So certainly not Kevin McCarthy, absolutely not. Um, it is not clear at all whether uh, Representative Pelosi is going to be running again. Um, it seems pretty clear that there's going to be a changing of the guard in the House. 
and there are quite a few candidates uh, right now who are interested in running for those top spots. So I'm going to be doing my uh, due diligence and homework as we head into uh, the time between the election, if I'm lucky enough to get elected, um, and the time that we vote on leadership in January. But I think many people feel that uh, all indication is that uh, Speaker Pelosi is probably not going to run again, and there's going to be some change in the House. Is that something that you would welcome? I think that uh, many of the folks that I've talked to in, in the caucus say that uh, Speaker Pelosi, if she runs again, they will be supportive of her. She's been incredibly effective in her job. But that, of course, you know, everybody is looking to what the next generation will bring for leadership. Well, let me ask you about uh, a related question. Uh, a Republican takeover of the House uh, would uh, easily mean, could mean a, a a McCarthy speakership. Please comment on his suggestion the other day that um, if Republicans assume control, they may well seek to rein in some of the uh, U.S. support for Ukraine. Are you both committed to continuing U.S. aid to Ukraine uh, as long as there's a war, as long as it may take? Ms. Ballant? So there are several things that McCarthy said in the last few weeks that give me pause, um, one being his statement about Ukraine, the other being his in interest in uh, essentially scaling back on the Inflation Reduction Act and uh, making sure that seniors have uh, caps on prescription prices. So he has been very busy in the, in the news lately. I think that we have to be able to do two things at once. We have to be able to continue to give aid to Ukraine. We have to certainly uh, continue with humanitarian aid as well. But we have to, given the situation right now with Putin uh, saber rattling uh, with a tactical uh, nuclear weapon, we have to do everything we can to put an end to this, this war. And that's going to need a lot of diplomacy. But you can't have diplomacy without, at this point, making sure that we are still continuing to support Ukraine. What that end point will be, it's unclear. I think we have to wait and see uh, whether we can engage people like President Xi of China in working with us to try to give uh, Vladimir Putin a, a, an exit strategy. Mr. Madden. So from the outset of this conflict, it was clear to me that there were two likely scenarios that would be the outcome. One would be a very long protracted war, which many military and foreign policy officials are agreeing with that neither side is very likely to win outright militarily. Or on the other hand, something terrible could happen and escalate into a tragedy. And the only path other than those two horrible choices is to put all of our economic and political and soft power leverage on negotiations. And therefore, it doesn't make any sense to me to uh, no strings attached give support to the Ukrainians. Our support should be contingent on good faith coming to the table for negotiations. Otherwise, there's far less leverage to actually ensure that there's um, both sides coming with something to lose and something to gain. So would you pressure the Ukrainians uh, to settle this thing, uh, even if it means giving up some of their territory? I think the best case scenario for all of Europe and all of the world to avoid a horrible outcome is a negotiated solution. Um, I think some of the terms that might be a prerequisite to the negotiating table might be Ukraine staying out of NATO, Russia helping to subsidize energy costs to rebuild Ukraine, and perhaps some of the majority Russian pro provinces remaining in Russia's hands. But I'm flexible about that. Generally, just to follow up, do you agree with the concept of U.S. foreign aid? Do you support U.S. foreign aid broadly? Absolutely. Yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Let's move to another part of the world. Uh, just today, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that uh, China has decided the status quo of uh, Taiwan's situation is no longer acceptable and has begun to ratchet up pressure on the self-governing island, including holding out the possibility of using force there. Congress has the power to declare war. If it comes to it, would you agree that the U.S. engage militarily with China to defend Taiwan? Mr. Madden. There would have to be an incredible upside for the American people to do something that belligerent and naive and to um, enter into a, a conflict with a nuclear armed rival. Um, I think that there's a long way to go of diplomatic and economic leverage points to proceed on far before there is 
need to even consider military action. Ms. Ballin? So this is a time when we need to be engaging all of our, all of our allies, um, using all of our tools of diplomacy, and also appealing to President Xi about the fact that the, the conflict even right now uh, between Russia and Ukraine is wreaking havoc on the economy of China. And it is, um, it is important for us to be the leader in diplomacy that we used to be in the world. And I think that we can be again. And it means engaging with people uh, like President Xi, with Vladimir Putin, and not turning away from the, the really hard work of diplomacy to try to prevent uh, armed conflict in, in Taiwan. Taiwan is certainly uh, an ally of ours, but that is not something that we should take um, lightly in, in any regard. So just to follow up, it would be a no and a no to, I think it would to be engage no. militarily in Taiwan. Correct, yes. Okay. All right, next question. We're going to talk about guns in America. What will it take to sharply reduce America's epidemic and mass shootings, and what will Congress's role be in this? Ms. Ballin. So this is, a, this is a hard issue for so many Vermonters. As I travel around the state, I hear from parents and teachers um, just how difficult it is right now for them to, to bring their, their kids to, to school knowing that they just don't know if there's gonna be uh, another school shooting. This, this is not the way that we have to live. I have been a champion on sensible gun laws here in Vermont uh, for my entire career in the Senate. I think we have to once again uh, reinstate um, an, an assault weapons ban at the federal level. I think that there is no uh, reason for regular citizens to be uh, possessing weapons of war. I think we also need to look seriously at uh, waiting periods for guns. And the big elephant in the room is what is happening uh, with our young men in particular in this country that they are feeling disconnected from, from their schools and communities. I think we have to take a hard look at what's happening and how do we invest money to make sure we bring these folks back into community with, with their neighbors and their friends. And Mr. Madden. I strongly agree that prioritizing reducing gun violence is something we can and should do and it requires that we enter a new middle ground. I've proposed um, numerous unconventional ideas that um, are just a starting point of conversation to break us out of the, the mold of dogma and getting st stuck on our heels. I agree with, um, well, I believe most liberals don't really tr truly value the real benefit of the Second Amendment, which is that it allows the citizens to coordinate defense against the government should the government become authoritarian, which might sound far-fetched, but I've been a part of our government imposing its will violently on a civilian population. I don't think it's so crazy that that could only happen overseas. Um, and I think conservatives tend to dramatically underemphasize that the Second Amendment clearly connects the right to bear arms to being part of something that is well regulated. So there's, there's a middle ground that can be found that honors both, both sides' values. Would you support an, um, an assault weapons ban? Uh, I would not federally su uh, support a, I would not support a federal assault weapons ban. Let me ask you about um, the president's move to forgive uh, some portion of student debt. Uh, 22 million, as of yesterday, have signed up so far, we're told. Uh, this would be a ten uh, or $20,000 uh, debt forgiveness program. Uh, but the president is getting sued over, over this, and I'm wondering if you think it is fair uh, to those who did not borrow the money, uh, who did not go to college because they were afraid of the debt, is it fair uh, that uh, only some Americans will get this benefit and not others? Mr. Madden? So I think it's a really wise investment on behalf of a, of a society to invest in the education of our young people, and I'm sure that we would have a return on the investment in people having more freedom to start enterprises and uh, to be creative in our economy if they were less saddled with debt. Um, I do deeply question the constitutionality of President Biden's move, though. Even Speaker Pelosi said that he does not have the authority to um, 
he can delay debt, but he can't cancel it. So that's the grounds I'm actually really concerned about, is that the president just superseding the authority of Congress. There are things that we should be focusing on that lower the cost of education. And I'm more of a root cause prioritizer myself, but um, in terms of is it fair to existing citizens to pay for the debt of other people's college education? Um, I would prefer to see some constitutionally derived debt forgiveness, but not full forgiveness. Ms. Ballant. So I hear about this from Vermonters all, all the time, that it is holding us back. Um, and even today, I was in South Burlington for an event, and a woman came up to me, and she said, you know, I am not necessarily the classic person that you think of as somebody having student loan debt. She said, but my uh, career was at a dead end. I went back to school, um, and now I have, you know, I'm in my 50s, and I have $20,000 worth of debt. And I did that so that I could get ahead. She's not unusual. I hear that story over and over again. What young people are doing today in the, the kind of debt that they're carrying is not at all what folks in um, previous generations have done, even when you um, hold uh, steady for, for you know, inflation. Everything costs more now. And we are holding back our economy, both our local communities and the Vermont economy as a whole. So I've, I strongly support um, making sure that we reduce uh, the burden that uh, people are carrying because it is, um, it's actually hurting us all. But is it, is it fair to those who didn't borrow the money that only some Americans get the benefit? Yeah, I really appreciate that question, Stuart, because um, there are a lot of different ways to get at fairness, and I was thinking about how we have set up programs here in Vermont to make sure we have um, certification programs that are free of cost, tuition free. We are trying to figure out ways to get that swath of kids that graduate from high school but never go on to do any additional training, making it affordable for them to do so. So I think fairness has to get to the point of, are people getting what they need in order to get ahead. And I think that's different for, for different people and different families. But, you know, of course, we want to make sure everybody has an opportunity. Let's turn to education. Um, students learning in the classroom suffered during the pandemic. You ask any parent, uh, they probably gave you that opinion during the pandemic. Um, that's not an opinion at this point, it's a fact. National test scores this week tell us that. The uh, nation's secretary of education says we need to, quote, double down on our effort to get kids caught up. What should the federal government uh, be doing to helping kids catch up? Ms. Ballant, let's start with you. I really appreciate this question. As a former yeah. educator myself, I talk to uh, my friends who are still in the classroom, and I have two kids in school right now. I have a middle schooler and a high schooler. And yes, te test scores are one indication that students are suffering. The other uh, really very painful indication is that we see increasing levels of anxiety and depression. And so for me, one of the biggest investments that we can make in education that will have a long-term effect is investing in mental health supports for students, for families, uh, and for teachers, frankly. The, the level of, of trauma that um, our schools have been through in the last few years, we're just starting to get a handle on, on what that means. So one of the things that I've been very focused on in this campaign is talking more openly about the, the mental health struggles, specifically in our schools. And that is going to be something that I'm going to be um, invest, trying to build a coalition to invest in almost immediately when I get to Congress. It is, um, it, we're at a crisis level right now. Mr. Madden, what should the federal government do to help kids catch up? As the richest country in the history of the planet, we should have the best educated children, and I would be willing to prioritize whatever it takes to do that. Uh, what comes to mind right off the top of my head is reducing the military budget and taxing the wealth of billionaires. But apart for some school districts that have far below the adequate level of resources, it's not just about more resources. We have the money, we have the capacity. What we need is to understand that according to the University of Chicago research, even small amounts of one-on-one -on -one attention can bring the dead average 50 percentile student up to the 98th percentile of performance. And if we couple more resources 
with a priority on getting the most out of our teachers and really treating them as the same level of respect and, and um, status that we give doctors and lawyers because we honor that that work is as important as any other in our society. So let me follow up there. So you're saying pay them more, pay teachers more, get more people into the, into the classroom. As an entrepreneur, I like to pay for performance when possible. Teachers, higher pay as a, as a former teacher? Well, I will tell you this. We can talk about pay, but we have an incredible teacher shortage and paraprofessional shortage right now, not just in Vermont, but across the, across the nation. And so pay is one piece of it. But I actually think what I hear more from teachers is that it's the conditions that, that they're working in and that they are feeling um, that they, they have a lot of students who are struggling and they need more mental health supports in school. All right, let's talk about the national debt. How concerned are you about the nation's $31 trillion debt, debt that has really grown over the five years? Um, that's about $247,000 in debt for every taxpayer in the country right now. Will you commit to ending these nonstop annual deficits, raising taxes if you want to expand spending, and cutting spending if you want to reduce taxes? Mr. Madden, we'll start with you. I think gathering all the resources we need uh, to have an economy based on the well-being of our average working people is very well possible within the bounds of a balanced budget. Uh, so that's what I would strive to do. And I think you, you need to do that by cutting fat from the military and, and taxing the wealth of billionaires again. Um, however, I, I'm not um, someone who thinks that the deficit spending is always immoral or irresponsible or um, uncalled for. So I think it matters greatly what we invest those resources in. As an entrepreneur, you know, you need to invest. Sometimes when you don't actually have the resources, you, t you borrow from the future to make smart investments. And I think um, I'd be willing to do that. Ms. Fallon? So I really appreciate this question. Um, I want to tell Vermonters something that I think a lot of people don't realize, which is the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed by President Bri Biden in Congress uh, recently actually paid for itself. Every, everything within that bill paid for itself, which was very different from the tax cuts that happened under uh, Republican Governor Donald, excuse me, Republican President Donald Trump. So it's really important for us to look at when is the deficit um, worked on by Congress to, to reduce it and when is you know, it added to. And basically, you can find, follow the trend. When there is a Democrat in office, the deficit actually um, gets more under control. And when there is a Republican president, we see uh, ex exacerbated spending. In fact, uh, McCarthy recently, in the last few days, the inflation reductions that he's proposing would add another $90 billion to the deficit. And so I just think it's really important for us to look at some other concrete issues um, around this. We could be taxing wealthiest Americans more. We could be closing tax loopholes. We could be preventing uh, offshoring of profits. There's a whole host of things that we could be doing here. And I don't think uh, we should be doing it on the backs of Americans right now who are struggling. Let me ask you both about the, uh, the border. Mm -hmm. Does this country, or, or any country, uh, for that matter, have an absolute right uh, to determine who gets uh, to come in and who does not. Obviously, uh, this year has been tough along our southern border. The uh, Customs and Border Protection have arrested more people than uh, any previous year, two million in the last fiscal year. And fentanyl uh, is coming over the border, and uh, that's killing Americans. Wouldn't a wall or some other barrier help uh, with that? Uh, to reduce illegal crossings. Ms. Ballant. So I'm really glad you brought up the issue of the fentanyl coming over the border because um, it's really clear. Uh, I was just recently reading a report from the Cato Institute, which is not by any means a liberal rag. Um, the Cato Institute says that over 90% of the fentanyl that is coming into this country is actually coming via Americans who are crossing illegally, either in cars or in uh, trucks or through ports of entry. And so I think it is important that we figure out how to get a handle on uh, immigration, both um, illegal uh, immigration and making sure that we have the, the supports that we need at, at the border to, um, to stop the flow if they are coming illegally. But I think that has to be coupled with the fact that we really have no pathway to citizenship right now. 
It's it, the, the uh, waiting list for people to become citizens is so backed up. And we in Vermont, we know this, we are critically dependent on migrant workers in our agricultural industry. And I think we need to stop demonizing the folks that come to work and are uh, constructive and positive members of our, of our communities here in, in Vermont. Mr. Madden. I am the son of an immigrant. I am the grandson of four immigrants. So I understand that legal immigration is a part of what gives us a beautiful, strong, healthy social fabric. And we have a workforce crisis and no one works harder than immigrants. I know that. And uh, on the other hand, we can't have a country at all without borders. And we can't have citizens, municipal, uh, sorry, cities and municipal governments and state governments flouting immigration law. I would agree that uh, fentanyl trafficking should be stopped. And if that's coming from uh, illegal immigrants or American citizens, there needs to be severe consequences for that. But I'm also looking to the root causes of what creates conditions in other countries that makes things so miserable where people are willing to flee their homes to come find um, refuge here in the United States. And I think we need to see it from that holistic viewpoint and recognize we need to make it easier to be a legal immigrant. I didn't hear from either of you, though, uh, about whether or not, given the crush of humanity arriving at our southern border, and we can't catch them all, wouldn't a wall help, Mrs. Ballant? Absolutely not. Uh, we know that um, people who want to cross the border are going to cross the border, whether there's a wall or not. And I want to expand um, my answer a little bit to say, if in fact we do have um, an influx of people who want to come here and work, in fact, given the workforce crisis that we have in this country, we ought to be making it easier for people to come here to work. And I don't think a wall is um, going to, I think it's going to be a colossal waste of money. I'm kind of pending further information. I think it's very likely that a wall in some places is absolutely necessary and in other places could be a colossal waste of money. Um, so I, I consider it just a tool and um, the way Donald Trump prescribed it seemed to be more about kind of whipping up, whipping up support among his base than an actual um, carefully implemented, well thought out process. So I, I think a, a wall can be part of our tool set, but it's, it's uh, looking at economic conditions and a holistic set of border policies. You're watching the uh, congressional debate here on NBC5. We're live in South Burlington. Much more when we come back.
Welcome back to the Vermont Congressional Debate, live from South Burlington. Welcome back. If you're just uh, joining us here tonight, you are watching the U.S. Congressional Debate for Vermont's lone seat in the U.S. House here on NBC5. And we're coming to you live from the new South Burlington Public Library. Let's uh, shift now to direct questions we'll ask of one of you, and we'll begin with you, Mr. Madden. In a June op-ed, you suggested that American schools need former Marines guarding them. Uh, sad fact, you said, but no other near-term alternative to protect our most precious beings. What do you have in mind? Well, we guard a lot of things with armed men when we care about them. We guard sometimes banks and jewelry stores. We guard politicians. Um, I don't think there's anything more important than, than our children, our children's safety and well-being. And um, I, I don't see a, a mechanism in the near term that can ensure the safety of our children at schools. Um, there's, it's just politically inviable to take away um, weapons from Americans. <laughs> We, we know that 80% of, of shootings are caused with handguns. Like there's, it's, nothing to me is more likely to cause a civil war than trying to enact that kind of policy. And so in the near term, we, we need to be looking towards policy middle grounds, but also protecting what's valuable um, so until we get there. So expand armed uh, guards at schools, or did you literally mean Marines? I meant people yeah. who, uh, have training and, and a commitment to serving their community. And it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, former Marines, but people who are, who are trustworthy and know what they're doing. Ms. Ballant, you are a former school teacher and a member of the NEA. Uh, they are a powerful DC lobby. Can you imagine taking a position on a vote that the NEA wouldn't like? Well, there's a, diff a couple different ways to answer that question. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I do not vote based on what um, my, my endorsers or the uh, organizations that have supported me um, expect me to, to be, um, you know, at their beck and call. That's, that's not who I am. That's not what I do. And, but the other way to answer your question is, can I imagine something that they would want that I wouldn't? want, and that's, um, that's hard to imagine. Um, when we think about this issue, though, uh, if, if in fact we had a push from the NEA to have armed guards in front of every school, no, I would not support that. Um, we see what happened in Uvalde. We had armed people there at the ready, and, and you saw that it did, not, it did not end well for those children. Could I follow up? Sure. Is there a is there a solution to the security issue that we have at public schools across the country? Well, I think reducing the number of weapons, um, certainly assault weapons, that, that's what I hear for most Vermonters as I go door to door and we talk about issues like uh, reducing gun violence. People say we in Vermont, we support the Second Amendment right. We understand that people have the right to bear arms, but time and time again, people say there is no reason for people to have assault weapons. And so I think taking assault weapons out of the hands of dangerous people is one way. Mr. Madden, you have said that you want to move away from the two-party system. Can you identify anyone of any party in Congress who you would partner with? Who would you caucus with? There's a couple different ways I could handle this. One is I could caucus with both sides cyclically. I think it would be very disingenuous to say I'm an independent and then go to Congress and then just pick one side, and that loses a lot of leverage. Um, another way is to just caucus with whoever the majority is. That way um, I have the most leverage for Vermonters and get better committee assignments, et cetera. Um, are there people in Congress as individuals that I think I could be very collaborative and, and, um, and productive with? Absolutely, and I think those people exist on both sides of the aisle. And they're looking for partners who can call attention to issues that it would be very politically expensive for them to call attention to. So I'm very open-minded about how I uh, caucus, but I'm not going to just throw away my independence and pick a side. Is there anyone specifically that you would caucus with now? Um, well, I've, 
I've long said that Bernie Sanders is someone who I would like to model how to be a fiercely progressive and independent voice um, and get things done in Washington, D.C. Obviously, he's a senator, but I would be looking towards people like him who, who are willing to be independent. Ms. Ballant, uh, could you see an issue uh, with which you vote with Republicans and against your leadership because it would be in Vermont's best interest to do so? I have been in the state Senate for eight years here in Vermont, and there are times when you have to build coalitions, and they always say politics makes strange bedfellows. And I have said repeatedly on this campaign that I will work with anyone in Congress that will help me deliver on those things that Vermonters deeply care about, like housing and childcare and, and uh, climate action. And so it's, it's interesting always to, to try to answer a hypothetical. I know who I am. I know what my values are. I know Vermonters are sending me to DC to represent them, not to represent party. And that is who I will be. How do you, I, I want to follow up. How, sure. how do you tackle that? You know, you mentioned the, the, your, your record at the state level and, and who you work with are your neighbors, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, how do you prepare yourself or do you, you do it differently when it's someone from Oklahoma or Hawaii or wherever that might be, some, someplace else in the country? I really appreciate the, the question. Um, earlier tonight, I was actually on a call with um, candidates from many different states, including a, a candidate from uh, Kansas. And, and she is a Democrat, but she's running in a purple district. And I know that our, um, the, the goals that she has for her constituents in a rural area are similar to the goals that I have. And, and we talk a lot about how she has to work across the aisle on issues that are of particular concern for rural America. And I know that's going to be a place where I will have to do that too and build um, bridges where I can. Let's go back to uh, general questions for you both. Uh, Ms. Bount, we'll begin with you on this one. Let's talk about election conspiracy. It's a huge issue in uh, polling this year. Millions of Americans do not have confidence in the integrity of uh, American elections, the fairness uh, of the count going forward. What is the path forward to preserve our democracy? Yeah, Stuart, I think about this all the time and um, I think, as you know, that the day that I was sworn in as president pro tem of the Senate, which was one of the happiest days of my life, was also the day of the insurrection at the Capitol. And um, I knew that Vermonters were going to be watching to see whether I was going to be able to work closely with the, the governor and with the Speaker of the House during an emergency like, like COVID, because we had uh, so much distress of government. And so there are no easy answers here. There are a couple things that I think we need to look at as uh, Congress. And one is really regulating social media and the algorithms that drive people to the extremes. I feel like that is um, exacerbating the, um, the rancor, the distrust. I also think we need to have, and I, you know, I can't believe I have to say this, but we have to have a free and fair election and a transfer of power in the next presidency, wherever it may be, that is free of any kind of um, talk about not supporting whoever the winner is. And um, it's, it's incredibly corrosive and it's, it's very scary, very scary. Mr. Madden. Did you just Tee up the question for me, please. What is the path forward given uh, the fact that we have millions of Americans who, after 2020, do not trust the integrity of our elections? Mm. So I came of age politically when George Bush was uh, appointed president by the Supreme Court. And uh, that gave me some skepticism about the integrity of our elections um, for many years. And I think both sides are and should be subject to scrutiny about elections. And I don't, actually don't think it's a bad thing to question elec elections. I wouldn't, um, I would rush to remind everybody that Hillary Clinton um, called Donald Trump's presidency illegitimate for months and months. She may still. Um, so questioning elections isn't necessarily the problem. To me, it's 
obviously violence, that's, that's a big issue. It's corporate money that undermines people's faith in our democracy. And it's a media environment, I would agree, that, that polarizes us and gives us no t common ground. I would be very hesitant when I hear regulate social media, I tend to hear censorship and not teaching people how to be better critical thinkers and to navigate a very complex information environment. Let's talk about uh, January 6th. Uh, President Trump has been served his subpoena. Um, all reports indicate that he would um, prefer to testify live on television. Um, Representative Liz Cheney says that's not going to happen. Uh, based on what you know from the January 6th committee hearings, are you convinced that former President Donald Trump deserves criminal prosecution? Uh, Mr. Madden, let's start with you. Well, to be fair, I have not followed these, these hearings very closely. Um, from what I can tell, Donald Trump is very skilled at knowing what line is technically illegal. And I don't know that he's crossed that line. <laughs> um, someone rid me this meddlesome priest. Um, but I know he has completely discredited and disgraced himself when a mob called for the hanging of his vice, president, his vice president, and he looked on and did nothing to stop them. Um, so I, don't, I think that there is a, a strong and fine line between illegal and uh, disgraceful, and I don't know that he's crossed illegal. Ms. Ballin? It seems pretty clear to me um, that calling um, the Secretary of State Raffensperger and saying, find me 11,000 votes because I haven't won, and if I get 11,000 votes, then I'll win the state, that seems like voter fraud to me. And so, yes, I would like to see the president held accountable, and if that means um, being convicted, yes, indeed. This is, we, we have the transcripts from what he said to these elected officials. He threatened election officials and asked them to defy their oath of office and find him votes so that he could remain in office. And um, yes, absolutely. All right, next question. Let's talk about law enforcement. What's your message to police officers and future police officers about your commitment? Will you have their backs? Ms. Ballant, we'll start with you. So I know that it's been, um, it's a, been a tough time right now. I, I actually met with the um, acting uh, chief of police in Burlington yesterday to talk about recruitment and reta retention of, of officers in Burlington. I have spoken with the Vermont State Police about this for years. And it is, uh, it's been a challenging environment for, for years. And certainly with the national trauma around George Floyd and other horrible acts of violence, it's been a very uh, difficult time to both support law enforcement and to make sure we have additional supports in the community. So I think what I would, um, you said, you know, essentially how do I re reassure law enforcement? We know, and I hear this from Vermonters, they want to have uh, a law enforcement presence. They want to have cops walk in the beat. They also want to have mental health supports in the community because they feel like we're asking first responders and police officers to, to deal with issues that they're not trained to do. So I wanna make sure we have um, the resources to give them the training that they need to feel prepared for this moment that we're in. Mr. Madden. Vermont has a uh, incredible uptick in crime recently and we have police staffing shortages and I think it just is an incredibly irresponsible move to call for the removing of the protections on police officers who are following the rules so that they can have um, qualified immunity. And that's just part of the picture of, of what um, police officers need to know that we have their back is to ensure that that privilege that my opponent has as a, as a public official, that her, her official acts when she's following the rules can't land her in court. Um, there's also, I agree, resources that it's uh, very important for police to have and it's also important to not expect police officers to be doing um, all of the work we need to have a, a healthy, safe social fabric. And I've talked to police officers who think up to 80% of their calls are people in drug addiction or mental health crisis. And so some of the resources that should be available to police officers should be um, helping, helping them take on that challenge. 
I have to ask you at least one question about uh, health care. Uh, you know, more than a fifth of our economy now. Do you, do you sense that the country is moving toward, uh, at least eventually, a Medicare for all uh, system? Um, or do you favor continuing sort of this hybrid public-private approach, Mr. Madden? As a representative, my primary purpose is to achieve as much benefit for the people I represent as possible. And so if there's a broad ideal that I can't achieve, I'm very willing to make incremental steps such as the Prescription Drug Price Relief Act. Um, but ultimately, I, I just don't understand how so many other developed nations have a um, nationalized health service that gets them better results for less per capita costs. And the only argument I've ever heard is that that would be too expensive or we'd have less results, but that's com completely contradicted by what I'm seeing across the world. So um, I think we should be moving towards that, but I'm happy to be making sensible um, steps towards that in the meantime. Ms. Ballant, do you believe uh, we vote for Medicare for all? I think we're heading in that direction. I think there has been a sea change in the way we look at work since uh, the pandemic hit. Um, Workers are renegotiating the terms of, of how they, they interact with their workplace. And I think we, were see, we, we saw so clearly that we have to decouple insurance from um, employment. So I certainly hope that is the case. I certainly hear that from so many Vermonters, whether we're gonna be able to convince uh, enough House members or senators uh, to see that we all do better when we all do better. If you have citizens who have mental health care, dental, vision, hearing, you are going to have uh, a healthier society in general. And it takes this incredible relief off of our small businesses here in Vermont if they don't have to try to figure out how to give people the coverage they want to give them. So yes, I, I certainly hope so. Well, I think we've reached that moment in the evening when it's uh, time for our lightning round. So think fast. I, I, one, like, uh, I like that smile, Stuart. <laughs> one sentence only, please. Uh, Ms. Ballant, have you ever had COVID? Do you believe in the COVID vaccine? I, uh, I believe in the COVID vaccine. I just recently got my, my bivalent and I did uh, get COVID um, back in the, uh, the, the middle part right. of this campaign. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. one, Madden. one, one how many, sentence. How many commas do we have in a sentence? <laughs> yeah, I um, apologize. I believe that the COVID vaccine should be part of the public health tool set. I did not get the vaccine and I do not believe mandates are appropriate. Have you had COVID? I have had a very mild case of COVID. Mr. Madden, what one item have you purchased lately that made you say, geez, this inflation thing's for real? <laughs> um, gas. Gas. Ms. Ballant? Milk. Milk. Ms. Ballant, what kind of firearms do you own? I don't own any firearms. Mr. Madden? I don't own any firearms. Toughest decision you've ever made in your personal life? Ms. Ballant? To have children. To have children. Ms. Mr. Mm -hmm. Madden? Uh, to organize resistance to the Iraq war while still in the military. Do you support Proposal 5, the Reproductive Liberty Amendment, uh, known as Article 22, Ms. Ballant? Yes, absolutely. I am pro-choice. The language of that proposal is too unclear to me to support. So you'll vote no. Uh, Mr. Madden, uh, ever played in a casino? Did you win? <laughs> um, I didn't come out on top. Yes, I've, I've done a casino. <laughs> You're, you're being honest. Ms. Ms. Ballant. Never uh, gambled in a casino, but we used to play a mad game of poker in Canasta in my house. Uh, what's your favorite kind of music? I love all kinds of music. I play guitar and mandolin, so uh, American roots. All right. Mr. Madden? I this is the last person that's in my head. Um, Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. What is your campaign slogan? And did you come up with it yourself, Mr. Madden? Uh, rebirth, democracy, and I came up with it myself. Ms. Ballant. Courage and kindness. And it was a team effort. Uh, Ms. Ballant, what will you say the first time you cross paths with Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene? Good morning. Anything more? We'll see where that goes. Ms. Mr. Madden. Good to meet you, Marjorie. That's it? My name is Liam Madden. Mr. Madden, are you confident you're going to win? No. 
Ms. Ballant. I am not confident, but I'm feeling good. All right, it's now time for our closing statements. Remember, you each have one minute. Ms. Ballant, we'll start with you. So thank you for tuning in tonight. I really appreciate that you're engaged in the democratic process. Look, these are unusual times, and I think it's really important that we all find our courage. Um, we talked earlier tonight about the state of democracy and what has happened since uh, January 6th. We talk about things that we never thought we would talk about in this country, about norms being upended and rights being attacked and free and fair elections being questioned. And I think it's really important that Vermonters know that they can send someone to Congress who has legislative experience, has a track record of getting work done, building coalitions, passing legislation that really matters for working families here in Vermont, including child care supports, um, climate action, housing investments, um, increasing the minimum wage, so many things. You have seen me do the work here in the Senate for eight years. That is the same person, the same kind of work that I'm going to be doing in Congress if I am fortunate enough to earn your support. So thank you so much for listening. Mr. Madden. Stuart, your last question. I'm very confident I'm going to outperform expectations um, by a long shot. Fellow Vermonters, my name, sorry, fellow Vermonters, our political system is deeply dysfunctional. And it won't be fixed by one side or the other winning a supermajority and saving the day. It is incapable of solving our economic, ecological, and geopolitical challenges. And expecting, sending new people there to change that, trying the same thing over and over, and expecting different results is insane. What we need are innovations to the process and technology of politics. And the only way that we can achieve that is through new and better forms of citizen engagement. And the Constitution was designed to prevent the concentration of power through checks and balances. But the only check provided to the people to balance the power of government is voting. And voting is not enough to course correct a system this broken. A system that gives us a choice between Donald Trump and Joe Biden is a system that has failed our potential. And I am here to remind us that we are capable of a profoundly more beautiful, healthy, and effective way of working together to solve our problems. And that's what I'll do as Vermont's representative in Congress. All right, Liam Madden, Becca Ballant, thank you so much for joining us. We know you are both very, very busy as we head to the November election. I'm Alice Kang. For Stu, Brian, and all of us at NBC5, thank you so much for watching at home. And a big thank you to the South Burlington Library for letting us host our debate here. Remember, Election Day is November 8th on that Tuesday. For all the latest Commitment 2022 coverage and information you need leading up to the election or to rewatch tonight's debate, log on to NBC5.com. Good night.